You're listening to a podcast of Relatively Speaking on MPB Think Radio. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning. This is Relatively Speaking, and I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. This is the show about you and your family. September is World Hunger Month, a month to spread the word and take action on the hunger crisis and then dedicate ourselves to a solution. You may wonder why we're talking about that today on this family show. But this is a very, very important issue. And despite being born in one of the world's wealthiest countries, there are many children and adults in the U.S. who are food insecure or hungry. So that means they don't have enough nutritious food for an active, healthy life. Now, food insecurity often leads to hunger. And so I want to talk a little bit as we move forward about the difference between hunger, that painful sensation of of just feeling like you've got to have something to eat caused by lack of food versus food insecurity, not having the right food, worrying about where your next meal is coming from. So that is a mental health issue. So research has long shown how food insecurity and hunger can harm the health and educational outcomes of children. But it also is harmful to adults that food insecurity or hunger can lead to massively increases in stress and how you handle day-to-day life. Now, in our state, the South, where obesity is a major problem, You may wonder how people can be hungry or malnourished, but it can happen. There are a lot of people in our state who are obese but have food insecurity, and we're going to talk through that. Today, we'll talk about how you can have both obesity and malnutrition and how both can affect health and learning and life in general. So I want to talk about what's going on in your life. And I I have a few questions for you. Um, Listeners, did you ever grow up wondering where your next meal was coming from? Did you ever go to bed hungry? Did you ever um, worry about how perhaps you would feed your children? Did you ever have an instance where the only thing you had to eat was perhaps rice or corn or something made with flour. Those foods seem to be plentiful here in the South. Those foods are there, but um, those foods don't have the kind of nourishment we all need to be able to think and live and exercise and feel good and learn like we really need. So I'd love to hear from you. Give us a call. I want you to join in. Maybe you have some stories about your own life. Maybe you have some issues where you know there's a fix. If you have some recommendations on how we can help um, our own state and our own southern region, give us a call at 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-672. 7464, or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. So around the world, more than enough food is produced to feed our whole global population. There's a lot of food waste, but more than um, 690 million people still go hungry. Now, It went down for a while, but it seems like the number of undernourished people has started going up again. And um, just in the U.S. alone, uh, about, oh, over um, 18 million children in the U.S. were food insecure. So um, pretty terrifying to think about how can we let that happen? 
Many children in the U.S. do not have enough to eat. Studies show that food insufficiency is associated with um, a higher prevalence of things like um, poor health conditions, generally feeling bad, stomach aches, headaches, more likely to get colds, flu, obviously more prone to get something like COVID-19. Um, and severe hunger can predict chronic illness. It also can predict school failure. As everybody knows, as COVID-19 um, sent children home from school, one issue that we started worrying about a lot is that children in schools often relied on the school's breakfast and lunches to, to feed the children healthy meals because many times when they went home, they didn't have them. That's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? The other thing I just want to point out is um, malnutrition's bad all of the time, but it's it's terrible, terrible for very young children that birth to five. Um, and the reason that it is such a terrible thing from that birth to five period is, as we've talked in this show, the brain is rapidly growing during that period. And so um, to grow properly, right, you have to have proper nutrition. And so proper nutrition is, is absolutely uh, paramount to having that brain growth triple by the age of three, growing into almost an adult-sized brain by age five. You've got to have the proper nutrition. So we know good food is not cheap. That's one of the problems. We talk about food deserts a lot. We talk about um, that the cheaper foods um, that I named earlier um, are not as nutritious as eating that apple or that broccoli or um, other garden grown, home grown things that you can grow. But often if people don't have those gardens near them, then they don't have access to them. Um, there are many, many people in our state and in our surrounding states who live in rural areas where there is not a walkable or drivable grocery store within 30, 45 minutes of their house. So um, I'm going to throw those questions back out to you. And then I'm going to ask, we have, I'm very excited. We have Dr. Ruth Patterson in uh, to talk to us. Uh, she, Dr. Patterson is a long-term pediatrician at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about what she's seen in her practice and her concerns, too. But again, listeners, have you ever worried about whether or not you could afford enough good food for you or your children? Have you ever wondered that the way you eat might be affecting your mood or your mental health? Have you been concerned about you or your child's learning? Do you think it could be nutritional? And have you ever changed the way you ate because of your finances? Give us a call, 1877 MPB Ring. That's 1877 672. 7464. So um, I want to pull in first Dr. Ruth Patterson. Hi, Dr. Patterson. Thanks for calling in. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me. So um, I thought maybe it would be helpful for us to talk a little bit about why we're talking about this on this show. Um, do you, let's talk about some of the reasons that poor nourishment, hunger, one, or malnutrition, where a child doesn't have the right foods, might affect their learning. Talk to us a little bit about that. And I also want to hear from you about whether or not you've had a child come in saying that they were hungry. Absolutely. And I, I think you've already alluded to the bigger picture that, yes, uh, hunger and food insecurity is an important pr 
problem, not only in our state, but across the nation. But it's usually not an isolated event. It's usually embedded in a bigger uh, problem within the family or some other type of stressful event within the family itself. So just reflecting back on some cases where I worried about undernutrition in, in children, I think in terms of a family that's come in as a mother where there's been some family disruption or mar marital discord, and now she's separated and has the kids on her own and in search or, or asking for our assistance and finding uh, some kind of uh, temporary uh, placement for the family. And that's a family that has significant food insecurity. Um, a lot of these are kind of acutely precipitating events and may not reflect that chronic malnutrition that we see for months and months across the world. But a marital discord and acutely putting that uh, patient in need for placement and supplementation. I think in terms of the young parents that I see coming in and often coming out of impoverished environments or limited resources and not sometimes not completely discerning what's proper nutrition. They're going to pick up whatever's off that counter and offer to the child, um, and it's not the right balance of nutrients that that child needs. And also, just as you've mentioned, just access to, um, you know, uh, grocery stores in their area. You know, it's easier for them to go to that fast food and pick up something that's not nutritious as opposed to making a way to the grocery store and finding the uh, right balance of foods there. So those are, uh, you know, some of the things that we've seen. And, you know, in today's stressful environment, if you have a family where there may be involvement with um, alcohol usage or um, drug abuse, whether that's prescription drug or other drug abuse, well, again, that's a stress in that family where proper nutrition is not placed on, you know, as higher of a um, preference or it's not the highest priority in that particular family. So, again, I've seen that more than the child that's chronically malnourished. You know, our mm -hmm. healthcare community will, will be looking for that child and reporting them to the proper authorities or removing them from the family. But I see lots and lots of cases of food insecurity that we try to work through the family uh, about those concerns. Right, right. And when we come back, we're going to go to our, our first break. And then we have Charles on the line. We have Roger, who was on the line. Roger, call back. I think our call got dropped. We'll talk about some of those health effects when we return, but I want to hear from you on food insecurity, hunger, malnourishment, how, what it does to you and your family. Give us a call, 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, well, welcome back and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking, and I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Ruth Patterson, and we're talking about food insecurity, malnutrition, what it does to you, what it can do to your mental and your behavioral health. So I'm glad you're with us today. Let's go on to the phones. We have Charles from Jackson. Hi, Charles. Thanks for calling in. Hey, um, how's everybody doing? We're doing I think, good. I think Mississippi, I think it's rated what probably number one, I guess, in food in, uh, insecurity. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of many individuals have problems with, say, the program helping people. 
uh, say the average citizen on the street. You know, we call it welfare. You know, we we're told to look down on, on that. And I'm not trying to say that I'm that I'm for or or against it. But now, when it comes to corporations, I think that I did. Some, I looked at some facts a while back. I think the government, the United States government, provides about $103 billion a year for corporate corporate sub subsidy. We also subsidize, when we talk about food, we subsidize things like corn, soybean, uh, cotton, you know, the, the crops that big farmers grow. And the USDA provides a lot of subsidies to help those farmers, you know, grow those products, and they will provide – subsidies to them if they can't sell their product below a, an established market price. But <clears throat> when it comes down to the food that you were talking about uh, talking about earlier, you know, the, 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 the garden crops, like the greens, the beans, the peas, the, you know, the things that the healthy foods that people really need to eat so they can be healthy. And to have those prices at a low, you know, to have a, a sufficient quantity at a price that people can afford. I, would, I just wish that there would be some types of subsidies to help farmers grow those kinds of products. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. hopefully Charles, yeah, yeah, I, yes. I hear what you're saying. And actually, we've we've talked about that on this show. Probably it's been okay, a year, I, I, I but but you're right. Yeah. But anyway, that was that was my thought that, you know, the, there are ways to get rid of food deserts because Mississippi had quite a few of them, especially in the Delta. There's a whole bunch of food deserts, um, mm -hmm. you know, whatever can be done to help make the food more available at a price that people could afford given the that we also the lowest per capita income of, of, of all states so that so a person could afford to buy food that that's healthy that's my comment yeah thank you charles um good definitely good comments you're you're right i know the subsidies have been looked at obviously um, our, our farmers in Mississippi are very valuable to the economy, and we definitely want them to succeed. But I guess my question is if farmers need subsidies, it would be good to have some subsidies go going toward um, individuals growing vegetables in, in more rural areas. One of the problems with um, what we've become as we move forward in our state and um, and other areas is that, you know, a lot of people used to have gardens, community gardens, used to have other grow their own food. And that sort of has gone away. Maybe some of it is secondary to lack of lands, um, lack of knowledge. Um, and so I know we're moving along in that direction. And um I have someone who has called in who's going to talk about some of uh, what our solutions are in a minute. Um, but as we move along, I think you threw out some good questions, and I'd love to hear from others about your opinions on that. Let's stay on the phone. We have Wren from somewhere in Mississippi. Yeah. Hi, Wren. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for calling. I agree with Mr. Charles because there's things that, you know, we can't even go in like in to Kroger, Walmart. Everything is so pricey. And I understand capitalism is paramount in the United States. But we also have folks out here that are like me. I'm a disabled veteran. I live on Social Security. And the things that I have to pay out, you know, like my utilities, sure. I have to make the decision, do I pay this bill in order to eat or, or, or what? And, but yet, unfortunately, they say I make $100 too much to even receive any kind of assistance. But, my Lord, why? Yeah. Why yeah. are they doing this to your elderly? Yeah. Because I know elderly people. I've got a good friend. She only gets six hundred dollars a month, and fortunate she owns her own home, but she saves through the year to pay taxes for that home. And yeah. Then her income is limited to buy groceries. I hear you, uh, Ren. And first of all, thank you for your service. 
And I think anyone who has served our country deserves a great life, especially in their retirement. And um, we do hear often that people make just a little bit too much money for a subsidy. So what you do is you, it's a disincentive to work. It's a disincentive um, uh, for people. So I think that that we just have to make sure that everybody is able to survive in a good way. But yes, if a loaf of bread, a, a plain white uh, bread, loaf of bread can be bought for a dollar um, and you can buy one apple for a dollar or, or two small oranges for a dollar, people are going to opt to buy a whole loaf of bread. It's bigger. It'll satiate you longer. It'll satisfy you longer. So we've got to do somehow better than what we're doing with that. So, um, Ren, uh, I think everybody understands what you're saying. Um, we just have to make sure that as we're moving along with policy and we're moving along taking care of people, that we do it in the right way and the fair way. Um, I understand before we go to our next break, I want Roger is back. So, hi, Roger. Thanks for calling back. Well, thank you, you are. For you thank you for what you we well, want to be sure that at some time during this program, maybe not now because I'm real high on the subject of food availability and I believe in the local sharing of backyard garden uh, produce mm -hmm. and all, and I'm pushing for an idea there here at Ants, Mississippi, the old Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist community. But I'm call I want you to address at some point. The matter of breastfeeding, which used to sustain poor children a long mm -hmm. time, two, three, mm -hmm. three, four, five of their lives, and it's gone out of style, and that's a terrible thing, and it, it, it would partially address some of the problems of food insecurity for children. It doesn't address the big problem, but I wish you would at least address that. Thank you. Oh, Roger, thanks for calling on that. I'm going to turn first to Dr. Patterson, and then I'll come back with some comments of my own. Wonderful point. Dr. Patterson, will you comment on what Roger just had to say? It's a good point, isn't it? Absolutely, Roger. And all health care providers are going to encourage any new mother to offer breast milk to that infant for at least up to a year of age because it is good balanced nutrition exclusively for the first six months of life. And I do want you to know that there are efforts out there to continue to encourage moms in that if there's a mother who is breastfeeding, she can still get supplements in her diet to enrich her diet as opposed to going in and getting supplemental formula. There are efforts to supplement the mom's diet so that she can continue to offer that nutrition. You know, unfortunately, so many moms do go back to work, and so they don't, uh, it's not as easy in a work environment. We encourage it, but it's not always easy to pump and save that milk if you're actually at work. But you're absolutely right. It's the best. It's the proper nutrition, and we're doing everything that we can to help to encourage and support those mothers so that they can do that. Right, absolutely. We do know that um, it's important for a mother who is breastfeeding to have good nutrition too. And like, like Dr. Patterson just said, it's, it's uh, very important. But typically what happens is um, mother will, um, if, if anything, um, health, uh, mother nature, whatever, tends to serve the baby. So that breast milk often is still the very best nutrition for that baby, even when mother perhaps isn't the healthiest eater. But we do encourage supplements um, for mother during breastfeeding. But that's available. And um, at least for some time. Now, we are working toward... Um, 
working toward uh, making sure there's longer coverage for mothers after pregnancy um, because that's really important to keep mom healthy for baby to be healthy. But um, Roger's point, I'm glad he called back. It's a great one. Breastfeeding um, will solve a lot of problems for many if they can, especially like Dr. Patterson said, even if a mother is going back to work, um, looking at using the breast pump for a while to try to keep that subsidy going. Better for the brain growth, better for the baby. Um, okay, we're going to go to our second break, and when we come back, we're going to go to Leanne, who's called in perhaps with some solutions that may be helpful, but we still want to hear from you about your thoughts about the food insecurity, the malnutrition. Um, has it done anything to you? You can give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring that's 877-672-7464. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and we'll be right back. Hey, this is Malcolm White. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Every week we talk with visual artists, musicians, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcast app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Ruth Patterson and we're talking about World Hunger Month. That's September. Um, there was a World Hunger Day where we were supposed to really concentrate hard. That was actually September the 10th. There's been so much going on with COVID-19, so much anxiety, so much disruption, so many people losing jobs and who never struggled with money before, now struggling with how they're going to survive. So I believe this is even a bigger issue now. In, in fact, um, as, as I was preparing for this show, I was talking to my doctor, my, my doctor, my daughter, who is a physician. She is an ER physician. And I asked her about, um, do you, what do you see in, in your practice when you're in the emergency room? Do you ever see people come in who are just hungry? And she said that there are times that patients come into the emergency room who are truly there because they are homeless and hungry and they need something to eat. They need a place to sleep. There might be a drug problem. There might be some other health issue. But often the biggest issue is that they're hungry and they don't have any recourse. And it gets worse as um, the winter comes along. So I want you to keep that in mind if you see someone out there. Think about what those people are struggling with. Um, uh, and instead of feeling anger or distaste for what's going on with them, perhaps think about how, how our community could help with the solution. Um, love for you to call in. We're talking about hunger, malnutrition, food insecurity. And yes, you can be obese and have food insecurity. In fact, if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, you're less likely to have the good foods, the lower calorie, higher nutritious foods. Um, cheaper foods tend to be carbohydrate late laden. So don't think just because someone is overweight that they can't be food insecure or malnourished. So join in. Give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. I want for us 
to go to Leanne, who has called in, with maybe some ideas on how um, communities can help. Hi, Leanne. Thanks for calling. Hi, Dr. Butchers. As you're talking about hunger um, and this month being Hunger Action Month, I just wanted to share one of the ways we're working to combat that here in Jackson. Um, right. I work with an organization called So Reap Feed, um, and this is what we do. We plant micro farms, gardens, and food insecure neighborhoods in our city um, to increase food access for those healthy, um, nutrient-dense items, um, the produce that people aren't getting from the corner markets and convenience stores that they're shopping at a lot of times. Um, so we focus on the neighborhood around us. We know that here in Hines County, one in four of our neighbors are considered food insecure. So we're growing food and getting it to our neighbors in need. Um, and we also just recently started the Jackson Mobile Market, which helps us expand that reach throughout the city. Um, we get to take these same items, the, the fresh produce that we grow um, and some that we get from other growers in the area uh, to parts of town where grocery stores may be harder to get to. And we sell it at an affordable cost so that um, people in those communities and those neighborhoods can have access to those nutrient dense items too. Wow, that's wonderful, Leanne. How did y'all get started? Tell us a little bit about this, how it got started. How are you able to maintain it? And and is there anything people around the state or in our surrounding states could do to perhaps set something up like this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our founder, Keith Elliott, and his wife started So Reap Feed um, really when they were living in Nashville and were growing at their church um, and saw a need for these fresh produce items when they were growing more than they needed and people started asking for them. Um, so the, the idea was born to grow extra and share it with people in need. Um, and now they're back here in Jackson and brought So Reap Feed with them. Um, so that's what we get to do for our neighbors as well, grow, grow more than um, we need to share it with the people around us, and we're working to teach people how to use those foods. We're sharing recipes with them um, and trying to get people out to the farm to learn how to grow their own food and to um, learn how to cook that food. And we've got a couple of families that we donate to who have recently started some of gardens at their own houses um, and things like that. So it's been cool to see how people are taking what they're learning here at So Reap Feed and putting it in their own backyards as well and using it to feed their families. Um, and some of them are even using it to feed their neighbors. Uh, we've got a chef in the area who wants to grow at her restaurant so that she can give it away. Um, and it's the same mindset of what we're doing here, grow more than you need, uh, share with your neighbors. Um, so people can do that anywhere throughout the state. Um, and if people are here in Jackson, they can work with us here at So We Feed as well. They can come volunteer. Um, they can come to the farm and learn how to grow their own produce um, and we'll help them figure out how to start their gardens at home as well if they need help with that. That sounds great. Um, talk to talk to us a little bit about um, is there any mentoring for children that uh, So Reap Feed is doing as far as getting children to learn about the importance of being able to grow fruits and vegetables and eating them. I, I think uh, Lauren uh, Elliott, who is uh, part of the founding member of this, the other, is our nurse practitioner. And I know she's talked a lot about um, how, how much fun it is seeing children get involved. Talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. We love to have kids on the farm. Um, we have kids who families who bring their kids by as part of their homeschooling, and especially now as lots of schooling is online, um, this is a safe way for people, people to be out. Um, you can stay away from each other, still keep your distance, but be learning in the garden. And it's really cool to see kids who don't like a lot of different vegetables um, are excited to pick them in the garden and to, they love to pick something and eat it right there. And a lot of times we see them, um, like a food that they have said they've never liked before. We've seen kids pick a green bean and say, I don't like green beans, and then take a bite of it and say, what's this? And we're like, well, that's a green bean that you said you didn't like, and they really enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, we love having kids on the farm. Um, we've got some chickens out here, too, that they love playing with, chickens and ducks and rabbits, um, so they can learn about more than just the produce, too, where their eggs come from and how to take care of those. Um, and we've got... Um, activities for kids to do, ways for kids to get involved in what's happening and learning about where their food comes from. Um, and they even get to get their hands dirty 
and work in the garden as well. Oh, that's so much fun and so good for children. Um, Thank you, Leanne. Thank you for all that you guys do. Uh, do you have some contact information if people want to learn more about um, your program? Absolutely. You can find us at sowreapseed.org um, or on any social media. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much with for what you guys are doing. I think it's just a wonderful asset, and I hope other communities are developing things such as this. I know there are some, and I think we had a, a call from someone who may have been telling us about something going on in Oxford, uh, so give us a call back. I know you got dropped off the line. Um, I do. Uh, we've gotten an email, too, that... Um, someone sent from UMC listening to your show. This is a resource for UMMC patients. There are social workers to help with different resources, including looking for jobs and insurance and such. They have a food pantry um, for UMC patients. So I know our social workers at UMMC do a wonderful job, and the ER works hard to connect people to those resources. Obviously, the emergency room is not a great place for people to go, though, if they need help. But to call for resources, to, to work on accessing resources, and we will get some different ways that people can access resources um, for any kind of food insecurity or needs. Um, all right. Well, thank you again, uh, Leanne, so much for that call. Um, all right, let's stay on the phone. We have Kathleen from, where is Osaika. that? Osaika. Osaika. Oh, Osaika. Hi, As Kathleen. We stay here. We're about 10 miles from Britain Spears. <laughs> <laughs> but, I know uh, Osaika. <laughs> that's okay. I, I fully agree with, with anything anyone can do. When you raise Cajun and in New Orleans, we cook for fun. I used to cook, even when I didn't have a lot of money, red beans and rice, black eyed peas, things like that. And I had four elderly people that uh, they had money. But Kathleen, Kathleen, house. Kathleen, I'm going to stop you just for a minute. If you will turn your radio all the way down, we're getting some feedback, and I really want to hear what you're saying. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, I hit the wrong button. I'm not digital. I'm what they call anti anti digital. <laughs> I, I sit out in the yard and talk to the frogs. You know, I'm not crazy. But oh, that when, sounds when good. We cook. We used to, I always by myself. I never learned how to cook small. I always had it in the freezer or dried foods or whatever. But I had four or five neighbors that had money, but they were not in physical shape to even cook. Mm -hmm. So I used to say, well, I'm just going to come visit you Sunday. Oh, look, I happen to have a plate. Would you like some of this? Do you know what it means to just bring fresh, hot food that doesn't taste like cardboard? <laughs> and I'm not saying anything about Meals on Wheels. Okay, I did. But, you know, <laughs> a lot of times people won't eat that. And it's just not that it's a lot of seasoning, or more herbs than anything. But... Just think about that, and instead of just giving flowers sometimes, why not give a potted plant? There's all kinds of little plants you can use, like stevia. You can pinch the leaves and use them, uh, you know, different little herbs and stuff like that. It's not a lot, but it is something. Anyway, I drive down the streets of the highways here, and I see lots of yards, lots of yards, not a plant in them. Yep. And I said, why, why not plant something? And they said, oh, well, I can't do it. Well, if you put it in the ground, thank God for fell the rushing, green side up, like he always says, and <laughs> it could be something perennial, you know, like thyme. A lot of times it yeah. receives itself. Uh, basil, it receives itself. And Lord knows a, a Meyer lemon in a, a, a pot would impress anyone, you know. But there's there's no stores in the country. And when they do, 
they have to charge so much just to have it there. And yeah. when you're when you're taking half or more of just for your note, your rent or that, you've got nary a dime to spend on anything, you know, like someone told me the other day they hadn't been to the movie since the Titanic. Well think about that. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. Kathleen, I want to re reiterate a couple of things you said um, because I think we we forget sometimes how how easy in Mississippi it can be to grow things that are edible. Um, I do composting in my yard, and um, and often if I don't turn the compost as quickly as I should, I'll have something growing up, a, a cucumber from a cucumber seed or a little tomato plant, and I'll coddle it out, put it in a little pot, nurture that, put it in the ground and grow it, and then lo and behold, I have a cherry tomato plant that's growing enough tomatoes for me to use. Um, so... To, to keep that in mind, and if we can start fostering our children to learn how to do that, I think it could be an awesome thing. So um, also cook for people. If you, That's a great advice to keep in mind if you cook a little too much to share. All of those things are great ideas. All right. I'm being told we're going to our final break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the negative health effects of poor nutrition. Um, there's still time for you to call 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464. This is Rel Relatively Speaking, and we'll be right back. This is Terry Gross, the host of Fresh Air, wishing MPB happy 50th anniversary. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back, and thanks for listening again. This is Relatively Speaking, and I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. We're talking about hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Um, it is rampant in our state, and we are working hard to do something about it. And many of you out there are doing good work, so keep it up. Um, I think what I'd like to do um, next is have Dr. Patterson talk to us a little bit about some of the effects on children from having poor nutrition having that food insecurity and perhaps becoming obese because of the food insecurity issues that are going on. Dr. Patterson, talk to us for just a couple of minutes about that, if you will. Absolutely. So if we have a child or a family that has that food insecurity that leads to undernutrition or overt malnutrition, there are significant impacts that it can have on that child. And you've alluded to uh, several already. Number one, it may be that child that has very lean body mass, or the other extreme is the obese child. It's the child that once he gets any type of food, even if it's not a healthy type, they hoard and eat, and it can actually result in a child looking obese but not having proper uh, nutritional balance, and so they are still suffering from some degree of malnutrition. You've also alluded to the fact that nutrition is, important at any point in life, but it's just paramount in those first several years of life when we have rapid brain development. So ultimately, it could lead to some degree or de of developmental or intellectual delay. It can lead to an increased risk of infection. They're just not strong enough, don't have the 
metabolic systems that are in place to fight infection. There can be some degree of immune dysfunction as well. Some of these kids, if it's long-term, they have sonic growth. So there are some significant impacts. But let me also just kind of share with you, what do we see early on in these kids who show up in our community, in our school, who are suffering from undernutrition or uh, from food insecurity? That's that child that may show up with some behavioral problems, some emotional problems, and ultimately it could lead to some academic difficulties as well. That's that child who may present he's he's tired, he's hungry, but what he shows you is he's oppositional or he shows signs of anxiety or he sh shows signs of poor attention or even sometimes some signs of aggression. And if that family is under stress, it may be manifested in school absences or just um, school tardiness. So again, it can definitely have some short term indicators, but also if it's chronic malnutrition, that's the child that may have more substantial impacts physically that can show up in, in difficulties with growth and development as well. Right. Thank you. That's a, that's a great summary. So what happens often is the first thing when a child is um, chronically malnourished, not enough calories, is that they'll lose weight, then they'll lose height growth. The brain is often spared until the bitter end. Um, but like we tried to emphasize over and over is that you can have a child whose weight is fine, but their nourishment is bad. They can be iron deficient. They can be deficient of vitamin D or B, um, even though they're getting adequate calories, they're not getting adequate nutrition. So a good reminder. Okay, we have um, a caller. We have Sue from Beaumont. Hi, Sue. Thanks for calling in. We've got just a couple of minutes. I, I just want to remind to... everybody that uh, if you yeah. eat beans and rice together, it makes a complete protein and that, that, that's, that's cheap alternatives to meat. But I don't know if people realize that. Right. That's that's a really good point. And, you know, you can have kidney beans or black beans um, that are fairly high lentils, fairly high in nutritional value. You can you can be completely vegan and have great nutrition if you learn about what are the right right foods to eat. So, um, Sue, that was great reminder and information. Food. Um, yes, some of our fresh fruits and vegetables are more expensive than um, some some of our uh, white foods, as I call them, white potatoes, white rice, that kind of thing. But um, I think as far as things go, um, you can get good nutrition if you read and if you do a little bit of cooking and a little bit of growing. So um, I just before the end of the show, I wanted to remind everybody that there are, we do have programs for children, WIC and SNAP. Dr. Patterson mentioned that um, we will post that information on the website. Michelle, I have that uh, for us. And I want to thank Dr. Patterson so very much for joining us again. You always do such an awesome job, Dr. Ruth. Um, thanks for for calling in again and sharing your great knowledge with us. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank everybody. And if you have, if you want to send in any information, I'll be happy to share it with others on our next show. So today's show was engineered by our producer, uh, Michelle McAdoo. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking, and that you'll stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now, coming up next on MPB Think Radio.